So uh, we are keep going with uh, our program and uh, the discussion we just had about how telemedicine has been uh, picked up and is being picked up uh, from uh, also a public administration perspective in, uh, in Spain, uh, it's a perfect prequel to the panel that is about to start. Uh, we will be focusing on uh, policy frameworks acceleration. Uh, and we will do this with uh, a very dear friend of mine, Paul Tana. Paul Tana is the CEO and founder of PharmaForum.com, one of the most prominent uh, digital media fo focusing on the life sciences uh, space. And uh, I can say uh, that uh, Paul uh, has been uh, polluted with digital health uh, already a few years ago. And now uh, we enjoy an entire editorial line within Pharma Forum that talks about digital health, uh, often in the context of uh, life sciences, uh, uh, multiple stakeholders and, uh, and payers as well. Uh, so let me welcome to the virtual stage, uh, my friend, Paul Tanner. Paul? Hi, Roberto. Great to join you on this virtual event and uh, I've been following proceedings. It's a great job by the Frontiers team. Hi, man. Good to see you. Uh, now it's lockdown beard. Uh, looks very wise. <laughs> it's been trimmed just for this, Roberto. Fantastic. So, I'll, uh, uh, you heard of the conversation so far. We naturally transition into uh, policy. We titled this panel Policy for Almost Acceleration, which is a little bit of something that we have seen, but is also a big hope, right, that these policies will accelerate and will uh, evolve in a favorable way to allow for all of this uh, to really scale. So uh, I will let you uh, own the virtual stage and kick off your uh, discussion panel. Thank you so much, Paul. Stage is yours. Thank you, Roberto. I appreciate the invite to, uh, to join you today. And yeah, we'll be talking about policy frameworks acceleration, which is something we've seen shifting in the past couple of years. But the current COVID-19 situation really has move things forward. So I'm going to bring in my panelists one at a time and just let them say a little bit about themselves. And um, perhaps uh, Megan Coder would like to join me first. Megan is Executive Director from the Digital Therapeutics Alliance. I'm sure many of you are familiar with their work, but they provided this consolidated voice for clinically validated digital therapeutics. So Megan, thank you for joining me. Perhaps you'd like to say a bit about your background and your interest in this space. Indeed, it's great to be here. Uh we are, we really miss being with everyone else. It's been such a great opportunity the last few years to meet in person and have all these opportunities to talk about what's taking place uh, from the digital therapeutics industry, the broader digital health realm around what's going on in policy reimbursement, market access, and so forth. So I'm really grateful we have the time to talk about policy, given that it's a really important topic of the day and year. Uh, background, uh, my name is Megan Coder, Digital Therapeutics Alliance Director. Uh, pharmacist by training, uh, but have really fallen in love with the, the possibilities of a smartly designed policy to really make impactful changes on entire populations. So with that, I look forward to our discussion. Thank you, Megan, and thanks again for joining me. So next, let me introduce Lauren Ripplinger, who's Vice President of Policy and Government Affairs at the American Health Information Management Association, which has really been looking at how we grapple with this explosion of health data. So Lauren, welcome to you. And uh, likewise, just say a bit about your background and your interest in this space. Sure, absolutely. Thanks, Paul. So as Paul mentioned, my name is Lauren Ripplinger. I'm the Vice President of Policy and Government Affairs for the American Health Information Management Association. AHIMA is a global organization that represents health information professionals that work with health data for over a billion patients a year. From my background, I've spent the majority of my time in my career working on healthcare policy in Washington, DC. Before coming to AHIMA, I spent a little over a decade working on Capitol Hill as a congressional staffer focused on healthcare policy. And I think you know what really interests me about this topic and gets me excited and I'm passionate about it is that I think that unlike other sectors of our economies, uh, we have not even begun to really tap the full potential of the power of, of data and its ability to really revolutionize how we provide care and coordinate care for patients. So thank you for the opportunity to be here today. 
Thank you, Lauren. Thanks for joining me. Um, next up, and this is in no particular priority, by the way, uh, Ralph gordon Yarn from Research to Guidance. Ralph, thank you for joining me. Oh, I think you're on mute. Yes. Thank you, Paul, for introducing me and having me. Uh, a bit of background of myself and R2G. R2G is a boutique analyst and consultancy. And why I'm saying boutique? Yeah, because we just concentrate on digital health. We do that since 2010. And um, the special interest in regulation, um, where does it come from? Yeah. Um, it's it's a piece in the uh, uh, it's a piece of the puzzle when we look at uh, market opportunities uh, for digital health services. Uh, it could be telehealth, it could be diabetes, uh, and when we look at certain regions or countries, um, this question of what is allowed and what is not allowed within that country, uh, how does reimbursement in the primary care market works? That's always a piece. Uh, in, in the puzzle to answer the question whether a market is good for a digital service or not. So that's, that's why we get into this um, rules and, and laws and all this. And different countries moving at different paces, so fascinating watching it evolve over time. That's right. Thank you. Thank you for joining me. And my final panellist, we really are coming from all over the world on this one. I'd like to welcome Mariano Corso from the Healthcare Innovation Observatory at Politecnico di, di Milano. Uh, Mariano, thank you for joining me. Likewise, just tell me a bit about your background and your interest here. Hello. Hello, Paul. Uh, great to be part of this panel. So my name is Mariano Corso. I'm founder and uh, scientific director of the Digital Innovation Observatories and uh, more specifically of the innovation in healthcare observatory at Politecnico di Milano. In the last 13 years, we have been uh, analyzing and measuring the spread of uh, e-health e in our country. We try, we try to estimate benefits and to disseminate best practices at uh, national level, um, uh, uh, more company level. Um, over time, innovation in healthcare has become one of my uh, passion and uh, most important interests. So I'm very glad to be here. Thank you for joining me. So we're going to cover off in this session. We'll get your perspectives on what policy shifts we're seeing, what we'd like to see, where we think the future might be. Um, and we've obviously chatted beforehand. I've sort of emphasized that we don't all need to agree with each other. So feel free to chip in as we go through. But the first question really is, obviously, th this has been acutely impacted, this gradual shift in policy has been acutely impacted by COVID-19. So perhaps starting with yourself, Megan, the, the first question is, you know, are there positive changes in policy or the payer environment that you're seeing really accelerate because of this? So COVID brought an environment, brought us into an environment that no one could have predicted. And I think we've all agreed on that uh, in earlier discussions. Uh, but what has been interesting is really to start to see, um, I saw a study somewhere, um, so no real ability to quote back to it, uh, but the idea was doctors are surprised to find that telehealth works. Um, mm -hmm. And it was something that we've all known, we're like, yeah, it, this is good. good. Uh, there's good benefits to what digital health or digital diagnostic or monitoring or even therapeutic products can do. So we're starting to see recognition that there is an opportunity here. And even if we regress uh, from where the current levels have been with telehealth or other technologies, um, I think it's almost like a gateway drug into this broader technology world where people will understand the benefits and the value um, alongside of the safety and privacy and uh, clinically validated co components of it too. Uh, but I think it has acted as an accelerator of sort. Uh, whether it's going to be exactly looking like it is now today, probably not in the future, uh, but it has already started a lot of movement, uh, both in the US and Europe from what we've been seeing so far. Thank you. And Lauren, let me come to you next on that. So any specific shifts that you've seen that have really been driven by this, this recent situation? Sure, absolutely. I would certainly agree with Megan that telehealth, you know, it, we would have not have seen just the explosion, um, at least in the US, you know, 
without the the pandemic, right? And a lot of that is due to changes with enforcement discretion, with privacy and security laws at the federal level in the U.S., but also kind of changes to the reimbursement and how we pay for such services. You know, the other thing I kind of add, and folks may agree or disagree with me on this, and that is really revealing the inherent gaps that we have with respect to our public health infrastructure and really that inherent need to focus on you know, the collection and standardization of that data, but also it being able to be electronically reported and automated. Um, I think this pandemic has certainly showed us there are gaps in that infrastructure and we really need to think about investing in the long-term of correcting those gaps going forward. Yeah. So I guess that gap between collecting data and being able to do something useful with it are two very different things. Absolutely. Yeah, excellent point. Yeah, thank you. Um, Mariano, I'd like to come to you next because Italy in terms of Europe has very much been at the forefront of the COVID-19 pandemic and thankfully appears to be now emerging from that. But have you seen particular shifts driven from your perspective in Italy or, or broader by this? Oh, I think you're on mute, Mariano, sorry. Yes, uh, yes, Paul, I think that uh, the, the health emergencies has highlighted uh, the role of digital technology uh, to ensure resilience and continuity of care. So, uh, and this is especially uh, for chronic patients that are a, a very important reality in our country. Uh, telemedicine, uh, I think, will also be fundamental in this phase two that we are entering. And so I'm very, I'm very positive. I have to say that uh, during this emergency, some use, useful actions were taken. And uh, uh, one is about guidelines. The uh, Instituto Superiore di Sanità, the National Institute for Health, published a document of guideline for telemedicine uh, in uh, three scenario, healthy, quarantined patient, uh, patient with symptoms for um, to be monitored and, and uh, chronic patients. And uh, reimbursement, uh, it was uh, uh, one of the main gap in our country and uh, now in uh, some of our regions, uh, the, the pricing were defined and particularly in Veneto and Tuscany. And I think this is a, a very good start and uh, is here to stay and to be spread. Uh, electronic prescriptions, uh, also in this case, it was already there, but uh, we had a, a further uh, spread and facilitation of the use of uh, electronic pres prescription. And finally, also electronic health record that was one of the main pillar of our strategy uh, in the relaunch decree that was published a couple of days ago. Uh, there is an article that is dedicated to uh, develop and spread the use of electronic health record. So, yes, there is something happening. Yeah, and I'd like to come back to the, the thoughts around how much of this will remain once we hopefully get through this. But Ralph, let me come to you on this point now, because you mentioned you've been monitoring this very closely for 10 years or so. And I guess you've seen a gradual evolution in policy, but have, have you seen particular big shifts in the last six months or so? Yes, sure. Uh, we've seen that. And I can't speak now to all the countries on the world, but um, there have been regulations in favor of digital health and also telehealth before COVID-19. So um, it was allowed, or it was not even, it was not prohibited, yeah, to make uh, consultation remotely with uh, with a doctor. But what we have seen, uh, maybe more as a common thing, is um, that doctors are making now use of it, yeah, and they are they are learning, they are making their first experience, hands on how it works, and potentially some of them they will stay, uh, they will stick to it. Um, in terms of regulation, yes, there have been um, some pushes uh, in, in countries uh, waiving basically restrictions yeah, which have been in place before. So that could have been a restriction on uh, first time visits. That was one thing yeah, so that you are forced as a doctor yeah, to have the patient basically physical in the office before you're able to, to consult them uh, him remotely. That was one thing or there were other uh, restrictions on 
the professions uh, who are able to make use of telehealth or uh, the distance yeah, of the patient and the doctor uh, uh, to be able yeah, to, prom uh, to, uh, to serve uh, remotely and, and so on and so forth. So there have been quite a significant push in those countries yeah, to basically waive those restrictions. And uh, that's what we see. Uh, and then on top of it, in some countries, uh, as we just heard from, from Italy, um, there have been introducing uh, introduction of, uh, of prices, basically. Yeah? So doctors in those countries, uh, they, could, um, they could benefit financially from uh, making a, a video call uh, with the patient, uh, which wasn't the case before in some regions, and uh, that was also one of the main reasons for the low uptake. Thank you. Thank you. And I think you referenced that. I know we're talking here about policy, but you referenced it. I know Megan referenced as well. There's also that fundamental human behavior change by doctors and patients of just suddenly using these things. And they've made that transition, which I also think is important. Um, but Roberto introduced this and he used that phrase that I've been polluted by digital health, which is a wonderful, wonderful tone of phrase. Um, we've kind of opened Pandora's box, I feel, with some of the policy and, and reimbursement systems around digital health. And I'm really interested to know where we're going to go in the future. So, Mariano, perhaps I can bring you back in on this question first. Is this an irreversible change? Is, is this direction of travel consistent? Or do you think we'll see some reversal of this when we hopefully get through coronavirus? No, I, I don't think we will uh, we will go back because uh, there is a, a very strong uh, evidence of uh, the fact that uh, it is very useful to both uh, uh, health operators and citizens. And I think that uh, one of the positive thing about the the pandemic is that uh, uh, people they had they had to to uh, to try uh, they had to experiment with. Uh, uh telemedicine services and uh or to see the 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 problem of not uh, having uh, uh these services in place yeah. so uh, i think that uh, there is a strong now there's a strong pressure on uh, uh regional government to uh, define a reimbursement uh, scheme and uh, to uh, develop uh, services and most of the most hospitals are trying to develop their own uh, digital agenda. So I think it's something that uh, uh, I mean it was a trend, but uh, uh, this pandemic uh, event was a was a discontinuity that uh, will accelerate the trend very much. Megan, let me come back to you on this point because so when you speak to your members that are working in digital therapeutics apart from being, I assume, mind-bogglingly busy at the moment, are they concerned about any reversal of this change we're seeing or do they think things will stick? Well, I don't want to speak on behalf of individual companies, but I think that notion of an evolution will occur. So obviously some of those aspects may uh, be pulled back, some may be built upon, uh, but I do foresee as opposed to just saying this is the emergency area era and now let's just keep it going, uh, I think that evolution and refinement is going to be important in terms of what specific types of products do we want to have? How do we evaluate their value in terms of clinical efficacy, uh, economic value, um, carrying on in terms of how do these integrate? What kinds of data that Lauren spoke to? So I think that evolution in terms of how do we use these technologies to address underserved populations? And I think those underserved populations are being recognized both in terms of location, those in rural areas now have more access to care maybe than they've had before. Um, and then also possibly underserved diseases. There are ways that digital products can now be used to treat aspects of disease that have never been treated before. So I think there will be a lot taking place, but I do anticipate an evolution and refinement, not necessarily just a rubber stamping on, we're good, let's keep it. Yeah, yeah, understood. Ralph, let me come back to you because it strikes me there's a couple of factors here. One is COVID, which is just accelerating everything. But there's also, as I see it, a kind of competitive factor between different regions. And Germany obviously struck out recently providing a sort of pathway for reimbursement of digital health. So how do you see those two factors coming into play? And how much of the change do you see accelerating by that? Do you see certain areas where we might retrench once we get through this? Yeah, I mean... 
definitely reimbursement plays a major role. Yeah. So if there's a chance of getting money for um, using those digital services uh, from the doctor's side, that definitely helps. Uh, or the other way around, it prohibited uptake uh, earlier on. Now with waiving of restrictions here yeah, and the, um, the, the requested making use of, of uh, those uh, remote uh, consultation tools, um, that really, I mean, that's, uh, that's created this peak, uh, which we are all aware of. The question was from you, I mean, is it going to last um, right. and is this going to stay? Um, I, I would have uh, basically two answers to that. Yeah, the first answer is yes, I think uh, most of the participants here from the digital health um, uh, uh, ecosystem, they believe yeah, that those changes will, will stay. So more than 60%, that's based on a global survey which we conducted, they say, yes, it will last. Changes will last. And uh, the second part to the answer is after this peak, uh, what we see is um, there will be a new baseline. It will be higher than before. The question is, if we just take telehealth as an example, um, how high will this new baseline be? Uh, mm. And uh, how, how fast will it grow from there? Uh, we think it will be higher and will, will grow faster. But then if we look at the details, uh, it might not be uh, as, as positive yeah, for some uh, use cases like acute care. So using telehealth just to have this uh, initial call uh, with, uh, with a rather simple problem, maybe that's something where uh, even payer organizations, they will not buy into it uh, over, yeah. uh, over long term and thus driving usage and uptake here. Yeah. What we more envision here is that, that um, a telehealth solution embedded into chronic care, that's something where we where we see that uptake might be um, comes a bit slower, but it will last longer. Um, uh, so we are very much in favor of um, integrating telehealth into uh, digital enabled chronic care and maybe also post acute care, not so much about acute care. Yeah, and that's a really important point because we do sometimes fall into the trap, or certainly I do, of talking about digital health, digital therapeutics as a single group of things. And mm -hmm. Rather like medicines, we have acute care, chronic care, rare diseases, all kinds of specialisms, and there are differentiations uh, within that. Lauren, let me bring you back in, because I want to kind of twist into another topic here as well, as we think about what some of this change will look like in the future and will it remain, mm -hmm. which is privacy is obviously a, a big aspect in all of this. There's an awful lot of data within these applications and, and people's natural reaction, I think, sometimes is to get nervous about that. But in times of crisis, there's a kind of, well, use what you need to use. We need some solutions. Are we going to be able to put the top back on that bottle? Do we need to put the top back on that bottle? Where do you think that's going to head? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I don't know if we've achieved that balance quite yet. Um, I think in this particular instance, it's such a difficult conversation to have because we're trying to balance consumer privacy with the use of for public health, right? Accurate, timely, complete data. And so trying to balance those two um, countervailing uh, uh, directions is really difficult. So for me, you know, one of the biggest things I think is at the heart of this is the issue of trust, right? Um, how is the data collected? For what purpose is it collected? Is there an opportunity for secondary use of that data? Um, does the consumer have the ability to consent or opt in to the secondary use? all those types of questions. And tied to that is, are we giving those choices to the consumer in, an, in a transparent, clear, plain language manner so they can really understand what they're getting to? You know, I, I see a lot of the discussions happening in the US, similar to a lot of the discussions that you all are having in Europe of, you know, there's the kind of this patchwork of different pathways right now or leveraging uh, big tech and startups to really uh, drive a lot of this work forward. I think it's really going to be some increasingly tough conversations as we continue to move forward. Right. I, I don't see a clear answer at this point, but those are the considerations I think we need to think about, quite honestly. Yeah, and to your point there, I guess when we think about data privacy and technology, our minds immediately race to Facebook and Google and those big companies. But of course, we're talking here more about a, a vast collection of startups 
but Thanks. all acting very responsibly, but equally grappling with some of those kind of issues. Mm-hmm. Um, Mariana, let me bring you back in on this point, because I'm interested to see how you've seen that data management, privacy discussion evolve. And, and touching on what Lauren said there, I guess there's two sides. One is how we actually manage it, but the other is a kind of public health, how we communicate and get people comfortable with it. Where do you see that heading from your perspective? Oh, I think you're on mute. Yeah. Um, yes. And also under this point of view, I, I think that uh, uh, the, 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 the emergency uh, is going to be a, a, a turn point. And there are, uh, at least in Italy, there are very good signs about this. It was uh, one of the main issue in the use of data and in the um, also in the aggregation of data from different sources. Uh, but uh, again, if I refer to the to the decree that was uh, uh, that was published uh, two two days ago, uh, there were. Uh, considerable uh, simplification of the use of personal data. And I think this is a threat. Uh, for instance, uh, it is that the, the, um, the consent of the interested party for the supply of the file is no more required. Only uh, the consent is required when the doctors are actually going to consult specific information. Right. And also there is another um, and another novelty that I think is uh, is uh, is quite interesting uh, in this last uh, decree, uh, there is the, uh, the, the, the the possibility for the Ministry of Health to process uh, personal health data, uh, combining it with the uh, data uh, about incomes of the assisted and their families. It's a something that was not possible and the, that uh, now is possible to develop the predictive methodologies for the evolution of the, the health needs of the population. I think our, these are two, let's say, uh, signs that uh, uh, the, 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 the value of the uh, healthcare system uh, is being uh, uh, valued so much that uh, now I think some of the constraints are going to be uh, tackled weed and uh, overcome. So let me just you know, play that back to you to make sure I understand. So that decree a couple of days ago, that's saying that to obtain the data, you don't need to explicitly say you can have this data, but if they want to then do something with it, so share it with a doctor, exactly. integrate it with other forms, you have to give your permission to do well, so. Well, it is still a simplification because otherwise the, the, the file itself with the data was, was not uh, even uh, transmitted. Now yeah. the, 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 the data are there. And also there are other, um, uh, the other actions, for instance, also private hospitals uh, have to integrate data in the, uh, in the national health record and the electronic health record. And this, again, is uh, an, important, uh, an important step towards uh, the, the development of a, a more uh, complete and comprehensive uh data set and, it, and is that situation that decree is that pretty unique to italy at the moment or do you see that in other countries uh, you see that um under some point of view uh italy have a, a, a good situation a potentially good situation in the fact that we have a, a universal system and uh, there was these uh these uh, uh this choice to have a uh, um common, at least uh, uh, inter- integrated, uh, interoperable uh, electronic health record with the, the data of uh, all uh, uh, Italian citizens, uh, which is something that is, uh, uh, is a very good, uh, is a very good opportunity. The problem is with the, the, the uh, I mean, uh, the level of diffusion today, uh, the uh, this is diffused uh, on 20% of the population, while we need uh, 100%. And uh, in many cases, it is not complete because the, the data from the, the private hospitals were not there. So if we have a, a, a big national data lake interoperable, uh, uh, well, 
th that would be a big asset also to attract research and uh, and investment from uh, abroad so this is this i think is something that we are, we are trying to to push for this uh, now for many years but i think that this should be a good uh, uh, a good opportunity okay let me bring that point to you ralph and then yourself megan so what's just been described there in terms of a relaxation of the rules around collecting data and the barrier coming in when you want to use it but also moving towards this, I guess, global data lake in certain areas and how we can use that. So, Ralph, from yourself, first of all, do you, do you see those trends evolving in other countries? Do you think we're moving in that direction? Mm, no, I, I can't really see that. Uh, uh, obviously, um, if you look at the, uh, at the, on the country level, uh, what are the discussions, the main discussions there, it's, um, uh, which touches on privacy and data, um, uh, data protection is uh, when it comes to the tracing app and uh, what we see there in in those countries yeah it's I mean it's still a, um, a huge debate yeah what what should be allowed and what not right. um, so all I mean the the common parties uh, they are still uh, standing against each other and then fighting their fights their usual fights so not sure if I'm um, too optimistic on whether this uh, has changed yeah, even in the light of the pandemic. Um, the question will be also um, maybe also more interesting yeah, on a on a lower level, uh, so to speak, yeah, when we talk about uh, companies and uh, when they are trying to opening up again and trying to use digital tools yeah, to get their employees uh, safely back into uh, the factories or the the office buildings and how do you manage that um, to select the right tools and then to make the employees and the labor unions agree on okay this is the kind of data we would need in order to uh, to get you safe back in yeah so that's another layer of discussion which will be um, um, equally uh, interesting but uh, uh, um, at, um, yeah, I mean, we will see many more discussions like that. Yeah, yeah, which is something we're grappling with in the UK as I sit at the moment, because unless everybody uses these tools, they kind of don't work to some degree. Megan, let me come back to you. I mean, does the Digital Therapeutics Alliance have any sort of position on data and how you want to see that evolve? Or do you hear certain things again from your members? We are in a really unique subset of the industry and it, it's been discussed in the other panels today too but we're really looking at primarily those products that are using software to deliver medical interventions to individual patients and therefore making medical claims so for our subset of product we're really looking at those that have already undergone a full clinical trial and all of those safety measures and quality measures uh, but where we really have taken a stronger stand around is the value of hipaa gdpr and all the applicable privacy and security areas so that for so it's hard for me to jump into this broader discussion, and uh, it's it's two very different worlds that I wouldn't want to compare too much. Uh, but we as an industry are taking privacy and security very strongly, and uh, patients need to be protected, and they need to understand what's going on with their data, especially when it is in the context of such a personal disease state or condition. Yeah. So I know I'm keeping an eye on time because I know we're rigidly keeping this on time. We're coming up into the last few minutes, so. One last piece I wanted to ask all of you, sort of, you know, fairly succinct answers on this to keep us on schedule. But is there something that you're not seeing happen in terms of policy that you really want to see happen in the next six to 12 months? And equally, is there, is there one thing that you'd say is really positive? So, Megan, while I've got you here, do you want to pick up that hot potato first? I would love to. So I think what we're seeing right now uh, is different countries and regions doing really smart policy decisions and moving forward with really interesting perspectives. What I think is missing though, is that cross-regional or cross-national collaboration. Uh, if we start to have 26 to 28 or 40 different policy frameworks that companies will have to go and adhere to in all these different areas, that idea of uh, interoperability and cross-nationalism of use of product is gonna be much more challenged. So I think the idea of how value is assessed and understood and implemented uh, does need to be considered from a global level, not just an individual regional level. Thank you. Ralph, let me come back to you on this point. So anything you're desperate to see happen that we've not seen? 
No, but I very much like the uh, this point from Megan now. Yeah, and I would love to see that. Yeah, a, a broader collaboration even in Europe. Yeah, not to wait for the next big uh, tech company from the US doing it for for us for us. Yeah, and not waiting uh, to um, to to the time when it, this happens. So, so I would rather like to see a European uh, tool and services coming up. Being able to uh, to serve uh, the European markets, yeah, that would be awesome, yeah, and not waiting for the Microsoft of this world, yeah, and doing the job for us. I would definitely echo that thought. And one positive for me from COVID nineteen is we've stopped talking about Brexit at least for the time being, but we won't get <laughs> down that route. Um, Lauren, let me come to you next on this point. Anything you really want to see happen the next six or twelve months? Sure. So since it's Friday, I'll be the optimist of the group. And I would say one of one of the biggest kind of positive things that I see happening and hope to see get across the finish line is really what the pandemic has done in the U.S. is stimulated this larger conversation around privacy um, and really this examination of does our current patchwork of laws that's sector specific data protection right is that still a viable solution or do we need to think more broadly and look towards the gdpr in terms of that's where we need to go the question is is politically you know we do have an election in november um, can that happen and that's the real big question mark in mind but i know this has really stimulated a lot more of those conversations than we've had in the last six months yeah and politics is obviously always a factor in these things, whether we like it or not. Exactly. Um, Mariano, I'll leave the final word to you on this point. So you, you talked earlier about some of the change you've seen. Where do you want to see it go next? And what are your, what are your hopes and ambitions here? Paul, well, uh, what I'm not satisfied, I'm not satisfied by the national and uh, regional government and how they are responding, and not only uh, in the first emergency, but uh, even more now in the, the, the phase two, uh, today there are strong investment, there are going to be strong investment on healthcare, but I do not see a centralized and coherent policy on, uh, for a digital uh, reform of the healthcare system at the EU and uh, uh, at least in Italy, not even at the national level. I would like to see, I also would like to see a stronger emphasis on digitalization of the primary care and uh, of continuity of care that was the missing point in uh, management of the emergency. Yeah. So uh, what I'm seeing now in the different decrees and policies is rather a higher level of expenditure on, uh, on intensive care, but no real European and not even uh, uh, a good example of national agenda on e-health. So I'm quite worried about this. Thank you. Well, I think a clear message from all of you there that collaboration across borders is really critical in all of this. So we are up against time. So I'm going to say thank you very much, Megan, Lauren, Ralph and Mariani for joining me. We could talk about this for hours, but I get lots of nasty messages from the event organisers if we did that. We've just scratched the surface. But I think at this point, I should probably hand back over to Roberto. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. Thank you very much, Paul. Thank you, Roberto. And uh, we still have a, a couple of seconds uh, to uh, comment. Let me, let me share uh, a couple of thoughts. Uh, I'm particularly enjoying the event, the dynamics, and uh, also receiving a lot of uh, great comments. Uh, there's one thing that I do regret, that I don't have the chance to shake hand and uh, have a little chat with uh, our fellow panelists uh, because I only get to talk with uh, uh, the segment hosts and the uh, moderators. So this is uh, something that I'm missing and I want to take the opportunity to uh, share with our uh, audience that uh, the Frontiers LT ecosystem is always growing uh, and particularly we try to add always, scout and add the new organization, new experts uh, that join this uh, faculty, which keeps growing over, over the years. And on this panel, uh, on top of Megan from Digital Therapeutics Alliance, uh, who's of course a, a very close friend of uh, Frontiers, and Ralph uh, from RTG, 
who equally has been uh, 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 participating in several uh, events before, we had for the first time HIMA, uh, which is becoming more and more uh, a partner of our, of our ecosystem, and uh, Mariano Corso from the uh, Polytechnic of Milan, uh, who we have been recently able to engage more with. And uh, of course, Paul, you know, I'm doing also my uh, little job of dragging more Italians in the Frontiers uh, context, which has been very uh, poor of in the, in the beginning, in the, in the first years uh, at, uh, at least. Um, Paul, let me uh, just quickly um, ask you, uh, I mean, you're of course a veteran of uh, uh, webinars and, and virtual events. How are you enjoying this kind of mix of reality where I can, you know, uh, uh, be on a physical stage with virtual elements and, uh, and, and, and you guys connecting in? What's, what, how, how it feels? I think it's fantastic. And I know this is, has not been months in the planning. It's been organized at quite short order. So I'm, I'm really impressed. Um, I think a bit more Italian is always good, to echo your point there. And I wish I was uh, with you in Salerno, not least of which, because you have those amazing views. But I think, yeah, we'd all love to be there and shake hands and have a drink together and see what's going on. But as a sort of, you know, fallback position, this is absolutely fantastic. For sure. Uh, I'm, uh, I've never been traveling uh, so less uh, since uh, uh, so many years. Uh, so that's... Uh, that's part of that, and you, you and and everyone connected managed to see a little view of the uh, what we are nicknaming uh, virtual events war room, from where all these things are being managed, either you know shooted or connected in distance. Okay.